Aloha! Welcome back! Thanks for joining me on the beach this evening. Have a seat here on the sand. Yeah, make yourself comfortable. Oh, ah, here you go. Got a little green bottle for you to sip on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Spark up that paranormal pakololo if it's legal in your area. All right. Comfy? Nice. Well, thank you for joining me for episode two of Ghost Lore of Hawaii, Paranormal Paradise. Like last episode, tonight's story is based in Kona on the big island of Hawaii. So I hope you all are doing well. Cozy up to this little bonfire I made here on the beach. Nice, huh? All right. All set? Good. Now let's get into this. This story is an event that I went through firsthand back in high school. To this day, I cannot explain what transpired that night. The fact someone else was there to witness this terrifying experience adds validity to my struggles on trying to understand what happened. This event would become one of the many firsthand incidents that would solidify my belief in the supernatural. A little back information. This story took place in the early 2000s during my summer break between sophomore and junior year of high school. I had just started to come out of my socially awkward stage earlier that year. I was fresh faced, having recently started shaving what little peach fuzz I had above my upper lip. Going from a shy, chubby kid with braces and glasses to straighter teeth, contacts, and I had lost my baby fat from a recent growth spurt, finally making me taller than all the girls in my grade, which was not always the case. I had recently joined the judo club after learning a girl I had a crush on was a student instructor there. Maria was in a grade below mine and was a good friend of my younger sister. Growing up, Maria was always roughing it out playing soccer or dodgeball and preferred scuffed knees over nail polish. Back then, she always had her hair pulled back tight into a ponytail and for some reason, hair sprayed solid. Now, as a sophomore, Maria was a standout in multiple sports. She had an athletic physique from all those afternoons dedicated to sports practices and also toned it down a bit on the hairspray. Guys in school now noticed her, including me. Like I mentioned earlier, Maria was a judo instructor. So I thought, why not learn a martial art while hanging out with my crush? It sounded like a win-win. Every year, one of the local churches in Kona hosts a pancake breakfast and rummage sale fundraiser. Booths selling baked goods like poi donuts and mochi, handmade crafts, and donated secondhand goods are set up along with an all-you-can-eat pancake breakfast. The fundraiser benefits the church, preschool, and judo dojo. The latter two shared a building on the church grounds. The old Buddhist church that hosts the fundraiser opened its doors in 1907, making it over a century old. For privacy's sake, I won't name the church, but longtime locals of Kona can probably figure out the location I'm talking about. The main highway passing through town drives by the quiet, unassuming three-acre property. A rock wall with raised fences backed by trees and shrubbery surrounds the exterior of the church grounds, 
allowing for privacy and seclusion. Greeting visitors at the entrance is an arched gateway made of local lava rock that was commissioned back in 1915. Walking under the archway leads to the main temple reserved for spiritual services and funerals. When viewed by air, the entire property resembles the letter P. The church temple, preschool, judo dojo, and reverend's home all occupy the straight and narrow portion of the P. The upper half of the P held the cemetery. Odd enough, there was also a basketball court alongside a section of the graveyard. It had always seemed out of place to me, but I just assumed it was used for the preschool. With this being a Japanese cemetery, it is not the grassy graveyard people tend to think of. Google Japanese cemetery and you'll find aerial pictures showing mostly concrete, gravel, asphalt, and whatever materials the family chose for the gravestones, usually dark granite or marble. Like a mausoleum, Japanese cemeteries hold the cremated remains of the departed as opposed to the entire body laid to rest in a coffin. According to Wikipedia, Japan has one of the highest cremation rates in the world. Over 99.9% of the deceased in Japan are cremated. One of the main reasons ties into religion but I can't help to think Japan's high population density and limited geographical size factor in as well. Having limited land, I'd want to maximize every square inch, so it would make sense to reduce remains as much as possible. But that's just my opinion. With Hawaii being such a melting pot of cultures, people brought their unique customs and religious practices, like these burial methods, to the islands. It's normal to drive past one of these churches while passing through any of the small towns across the state. On average, it takes about two hours for a body to be completely cremated leaving about three to seven pounds of ash and bone. Growing up, I learned an interesting, albeit a bit morbid, Japanese ritual involved in these ceremonies. Kotsuage is the practice of collecting a person's ashes after cremation has completed. Loved ones are brought into the crematoria chamber once the ash has cooled, then begin collecting the bone fragments to be placed in an urn. Family members use large chopsticks to pick these bones out of the ash, starting from the feet, moving up towards the head. They then pass these bones, assembly line style, person to person, chopstick to chopstick, before placing them into the urn. The thought of seeing the bones and ash from a recently deceased loved one gave me the creeps, especially as a young boy. The urns holding the ash are brought home by relatives, held at the shrine, or immediately taken to the graveyard. Because urns are significantly smaller than a coffin, the average being about the size of a vase, graves are placed much closer together. If I were to guess, there are over a thousand graves already standing in that Kona cemetery. In the daylight, there's a somber beauty walking through these markers etched in Japanese kanji. 
the calligraphy indicating who was laid to rest forever in that spot. The night before the fundraiser, volunteers consisting of church members and parents of the judo students gathered to prepare for the breakfast. My mom had always volunteered her time to help for my extracurricular activities and was already hard at work cutting up Portuguese sausage that would be cooked up and served alongside the pancakes. Most of the students at the dojo were my age, and coming from a small town high school, everyone knew everyone. We mostly hung out, talking story in the convention hall, while organizing the donated clothing. But mostly, talking story. Like I mentioned earlier, I was a bit girl crazy at that time. Not that I had any clue on how to spit game, as kids put it, but oh how I thought I did. The cringe in my overconfidence still keeps me awake at night. All night, I had been wanting to find a reason to sneak away from the group for some alone time with Maria. I was crushing on her all summer and was eager to find out if the feeling was mutual. When the rest of the group was distracted in their own conversation, I asked Maria if she knew about the secret basketball court in the graveyard. Being an instructor at the dojo, Of course she did, but I played dumb anyway. Think you can beat me at horse? I challenged, knowing she was competitive, especially against guys. She smirked and slyly motioned towards the door with a nod of her head. The stroll up to the basketball court was less than a quarter mile. The road was dark. No lights were installed in the cemetery since the church closed at dusk. At first, the only light to guide our walk came from the residual spillover from the convention hall at our backs. The deeper towards the graveyard we walked, the darker and quieter it got. As the church lights faded, the glow of the nearly full moon helped illuminate our adventure. Conversation flowed easily, so neither of us noticed that we had crossed into the grounds of the cemetery. By the time we did notice, we were almost to our destination. This secret spot was tucked in the back of the property. Heavy overgrown foliage ordained the tops of the fence that contained the basketball court. Walking up to the fence entrance, we noticed it was padlocked, so entering would not be possible. I realized neither of us brought a basketball and wondered if a game of horse was just Maria's way of trying to spend some time with me. See? Like I said overconfidence. Leaning against the fence, we chatted high school things. Summer vacation, upcoming classes, who was dating who. I easily lost track of time, immersed in the scent of hairspray 
and hormones. Then, a great idea popped into my head. We could take a stroll around the graves, and if Maria got scared, I would be there to, you know, protect. I was busy working out how I'd pitch the idea of exploring the graves when surprisingly, Maria suggested it before I could. Come to find out, Maria had a bit of a morbid side. She was into grave rubbing, which wasn't robbing graves, as I initially thought she said. She explained the art of grave rubbing transfers a gravestone's inscription onto paper by rubbing charcoal or pencil lead over the entirety of its face. Capturing the lettering, cracks, and natural weathering of the stone is the beauty of the art, she said. Isn't that kind of disrespectful to the dead? I asked not intending my question to sound so disturbed. Not the way Maria saw it. The first step to grave rubbing is to gently clean the gravestone, so in her eyes, she was sort of restoring it. She had a collection of 21 grave rubbings neatly stored in an art portfolio in her room. It was the rubbings of smaller graves, mostly babies or children, that fascinated her the most. The age on the youngest gravestone captured in her collection was just four days old. The dates on the grave marker said late 1800s. Doctors didn't really know anything back then, You know butt plugs were used to treat migraines? Maria said out of nowhere. Yeah, totally. What? What? Her comment threw me off, and we both started laughing. The white light of the moon bounced off the graves that seemed to tower over us. Like being surrounded in a crowd of people... The sea of graves seemed to push up against us claustrophobically. The formality of the gray and black coloring of the gravestones enhanced the eeriness of the night. Do you believe whistling at night attracts ghosts? I ask. In Hawaii culture, it is believed whistling at night attracts the huaka'ipo, or night marchers. Night marchers are a procession of ancient Hawaiian spirits that are extremely popular in Hawaii lore. Their chanting, drums, and light from their torches can be seen and heard throughout the valleys of Hawaii. The night marchers deserve their own dedicated episode, which I'll cover in the future. In Japanese culture, it is believed whistling at night attracts spirits of the dead. The folklore talks of monsters and spirits communicating with each other through whistling. So the belief is, by whistling at night, you are calling to these spirits. Hoping to creep Maria out a bit, I tested this superstition. She joined in on the whistling. You never think of a graveyard being so naturally bright, Maria observed. True, I thought to myself. I always imagined graveyards being pitch black on a moonless night, but we could practically see every individual gravestone illuminated around us. Then, 
remembering these were the remains of almost a thousand people, instantly gave me the chills. It must have been the same feeling for Maria, because she shivered while folding her arms. I should come and do some rubbing. As she trailed off on her last note, I turned to her, curious of the sudden silence. Do you hear that? The moonlight enhanced the concern plastered on her face. I chuckled out loud thinking she was trying to spook me. I started to call her out on it, but was quickly shushed quiet. Maria's eyes were wide and unblinking. I scanned the property around us. We had strolled to the center of the cemetery. Graves surrounded us in every direction. Their reflective granite and marble surfaces glimmered like black diamonds in the night. The path out and back to the main road was no longer visible, camouflaged amongst the rows of death markers. I played along and quieted my breathing, attempting to hear what she was referring to. I thought I heard a low rumble or hum, possibly a generator. Maybe it's one of those transformers, you know, on top of the telephone pole. Maria's eyes narrowed as she shook her head, cutting me off silently. She placed her index finger over her mouth. The universal sign to shut the fuck up. The seriousness conveyed in her eyes raised the hair on my arms. Without breaking eye contact, her head slightly tilted like a confused puppy, she whispered, Listen. Then, I heard it. It started off low, almost a rumble, then slowly crescendoed. What was that? Frozen, we both tried making sense of what we were hearing. The sound intensified. Is that a moan? Someone was groaning. Was someone trying to scare us? Before I could suggest my theory, we heard more. A lot more. Additional disembodied voices joined in. What started off as sounding like one or two people eventually surrounded us. At first, I thought our friends were trying to scare us, but these voices, there were way too many. All the volunteers combined down at the church, there had only been about 20 people. These sounds were being made by at least twice that, and they were moving, circling us, like sharks circle prey. There's something debilitating about not being able to comprehend a situation you're in. You reassure yourself there has to be a logical explanation, but racking your brain comes up empty-handed. This was that scenario. What felt like hours, but was probably less than a minute, 
We stood, frozen in fear, not understanding what we were immersed in. In a panic, I scoured the graves immediately around us for signs of anyone that might be messing with us. No one else was in that graveyard that night. Well, no one living. When that reality hit me, I said, fuck this. I started sprinting through the labyrinth of graves, searching for the main road. You're leaving me. So much for protector. We ran through the labyrinth of graves back to the main road. Without stopping for a breather, we continued to run, swearing in disbelief, back to the volunteers finishing up prep for the night. We busted through to the kitchen, out of breath and barely able to stand. The parents half listened as Maria and I explained what we both just experienced, more concerned with cleaning up for the night than the hyperventilating teens in front of them. Wait, you guys were playing in the cemetery? My mom asked. Before I could answer, Bakatare, she half scolded in Japanese, basically calling me an idiot. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes, she chuckled. Looking back now, I can see how misguided we can be in our youth. The decisions we make tend to be heavily influenced by many outside factors. I thought a little cuddle sesh in the graveyard was innocent fun. Whether unintentional or not, we were disrespecting those laid to rest in that cemetery. In my older years, I now understand the inappropriateness of my actions. Challenging superstitions for the sake of entertainment may seem fun. Bloody Mary, contacting the dead through a Ouija board, whistling at night to attract the spirits of the dead. Just remember, it's all fun and games until you are successful. I'd like to end this story with a little irony. Unintended outcomes due to decisions made for the wrong reasons can come back to bite you. Back to the reason why I joined judo in the first place. I was into lifting weights and was a decent wrestler. I thought by joining judo, I could impress a crush by trying to beat people up under the guise of sport. Well, according to good old Wikipedia, it turns out the whole principle of the martial art was developed so weaker opponents could beat stronger ones by using the latter's power and balance against them. I would eventually go on to have my shoulder dislocated in an arm bar during practice one evening. Guess who was applying said arm bar? It was Maria, but that's a different but very true story. Thank you so much for joining me on episode two of Ghost Lore of Hawaii, Paranormal Paradise. First off, although this was a true story, the character Maria for this tale was an amalgamation of a few friends from high school. I really did witness this unexplainable event with a girl I dated, but haven't been in touch for years and wonder how she remembers that night. I tried my best to recreate the vocals I heard, 
but nothing can compare to the experience itself. I was not exaggerating about the sheer number of disembodied voices that surrounded us. I still cannot find a rational explanation for this night. It's been years since I visited the church, and I'm curious to see if any changes have been made. In researching this episode, I looked at a satellite view of the grounds and can verify. The basketball court still stands, surrounded by graves and whatever else inhabits those grounds. Thank you again for tuning in to Ghost Lore of Hawaii, Paranormal Paradise. If you want to email a story you'd like to hear in the podcast or have some advice or feedback, you can reach me at ghostlore.of.hawaii at gmail.com. You can also find the show's Instagram account at ghostlore.of.hawaii. Stop by and say hi. If you are entertained, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It helps other people find the show and does make a huge difference. Names and locations may be slightly altered for privacy's sake, but the backbone of the story will remain the same. You know butt plugs were used to treat migraines?